This is going to be an overview of the book of Genesis. In the very first verse of the book of Genesis, the first verse in the Bible, the Lord tells us how it all started. It says in Genesis 1-1, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So it started with God. And God was here before the beginning. So say goodbye to evolution and the Big Bang and atheism and all the modern philosophies of man. In Genesis 1, we find out he created the earth and man and animals and how he gave man dominion over the animals. So out goes the idea that animals are just as important as men. Anyone who would rather save a dog locked in a hot car over a baby locked in a hot car is crazy. Uh, animals don't have as much rights as people. So say goodbye to the wisdom of this world when you read the Bible. Anyone who says that men are equal to animals has lost their mind. In Genesis 2, the Lord describes how he breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. And you're here today because of that same breath. The Lord causes a deep sleep to fall on Adam in Genesis 2, 21 and 22. It says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh and stood thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. So Adam and Eve are given two commands. Adam needs to dress and keep the Garden of Eden and never eat off of a certain tree. And you know the story. They both eat the fruit. Adam wasn't deceived, but Eve was deceived. She gave in to the temptation from the serpent. And this goes against the saying of man, which says that man is basically good. But even 6,000 years ago, we find that man is basically just good at sinning, and that's it. We find that God gave man a choice, and man didn't choose God. And that is how we got to the mess that we are in today. That is why you have sin and sickness and disease and death and natural disasters, bad things happening to seemingly good people, and any other bad thing that happens. It's because of sin. This is answered in the third chapter of the Bible, and this is why women have painful childbirth and why man has to wake up and do hard labor to eat. And in Genesis chapter 3, you have a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ crushing the head of the serpent. And in Genesis 3.15, it says, And I will put enmity between thee, which is the devil, and the woman, and between thy seed, which is the devil's seed, and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. For this reason, the devil wants to corrupt the seed. We go on to Genesis 4, and he moves Cain to kill Abel to try and get rid of the seed. And I'm sure you've seen, if you have read much of the Bible, that every single story points to the Lord Jesus Christ in some way. Cain killing Abel pictures the religious crowd killing the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Adam and Eve have Seth and Abel's place. And then you go to Genesis chapter 5, we are introduced to a man named Enoch who walked with God. It says, he was not, for God took him. And that shows us the rapture. That is introduced to us in the New Testament because Enoch is translated without dying, just like Christians who are alive at the rapture will be translated without dying. Hebrews 11.5 says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. So Enoch walked with God. He had a son named Methuselah who ended up being the oldest person in the Bible at 969 years old. And he must have, Enoch must have trained Methuselah up in the way he should go. And Methuselah must have honored his father and mother because his days were long on the earth. And his name itself means when he is dead it shall be sent. And then when he died, here it come, the flood came. But right before that, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took the wives of all which they chose. Thence what? This once again is the devil trying to mess up the seed that's going to crush his head. Before the flood, the Lord gives instructions to Noah about how to build the ark. The ark pictures Jesus Christ. It has one door. Just like Jesus is the only 
door to heaven. And the same way the Lord gives Noah instructions on how to build the ark, he gives us instructions on how to be saved. And that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Noah walked with God when everyone else was wicked. Noah was living for God. That shows us as Christians today, we should walk in the Spirit. Noah was a saint going against the world around him. Just like today as Christians, we don't need to be conformed to the image of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind, as Paul tells us in the New Testament. You know the story. Noah eventually gets off the ark and builds an altar. The first thing he is thinking about is giving something to the Lord who just brought him through the storm. So think about God when things are good, and think about God when things are bad. At this time, the Lord tells Noah to be fruitful and multiply. He tells him to replenish the earth, just like he said to Adam. He told Adam, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So study that word replenish if you want a really good deep study there. But it's not long until the serpent strikes again. And every saint will face the serpent. Not just other devils, but the devil. Peter calls him your adversary. Not just the adversary, but he's your adversary. He may not be able to be everywhere at once, but he can get around pretty quick. But he somehow gets Noah drunk, and Ham, which is one of Noah's sons, uncovers his father's nakedness in his tent, and his son Canaan is cursed. But the nations descend from Noah. It would be just like if you and your family, say you and your wife and your sons and their wives all survived a big apocalyptic event your sons and their wives would have to be fruitful and multiply so that's what noah and noah's wife and his sons and daughters-in-law did everyone on the earth came from noah's three sons shem ham and japheth and even after god destroyed the giants and all the wicked people on earth with the flood it didn't take them long to get wicked again on the earth when things start going good then men tend to get more wicked but be faithful when things are going good. When things are going good, pray. When things are going bad, pray. Just be good even when things are going good. When when things start going good, many times people start thinking they can make it on their own without God. And that is exactly what happened in Genesis 11 when men began to build the Tower of Babel. But the Lord wasn't pleased. He came down and looked at it, and he saw the wickedness of man. He saw that every man was of one language and one speech, so he confounded their language. And when men get together and become prosperous, they tend to forget about God. But in Genesis 11, one of the greatest and most well-known characters is born, and his name is Abraham. Abraham is referred to as the friend of God, but he was still a man, just like Noah was still a sinner. And Abraham had faith, and he still fell short of the glory of God. When he went to Egypt, he lied about his wife. See, his wife's name was Sarai. Later, her name would be Sarah. But he lied and said that she was his sister, because he thought the men there would kill him to take his wife. So now he told a half-truth, because Sarah was his half-sister. This is before it was wrong to marry your own kin. So he lied about his wife, and that's why Paul says, Let God be true, but every man a liar. You see, these Old Testament saints are just like me and you. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, Man in his best state is altogether vanity. But now since he lied about his wife, Pharaoh took Sarah, his wife. And then the Lord plagues Pharaoh for taking her. One thing is for certain, in the Bible, the Lord doesn't like for you to take another man's wife. And, you know, this happened again with, with his son, with Abraham's son. He did the same thing. He lied about his wife, and that's where you get the saying, like father, like son. But before him, Abraham had a nephew named Lot, and Lot and Abraham couldn't dwell together, so Lot pitches his tent towards Sodom. In Genesis thirteen thirteen. It says the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners exceedingly before the Lord. That's how God feels about the Sodomites. That's how God feels about you if you're a Sodomite. That's how God feels about this country we're in that is catering to 
sex perverts. But Lot is a righteous man dwelling in a wicked place. Second Peter 2 8 says, For that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. So just like Christians in America are righteous men dwelling in a wicked place, everywhere you go, people ought to think there's something different about you. You shouldn't be like Lot because, you know, Lot was kind of blending in. There ought to be something different about you wherever you go, whether it be school or work or just walking down the street. You shouldn't be participating in all the sinful activities going on around you. But Lot is eventually captured in all his goods. Abraham finds out about it and gets his servants together that he trained himself. They go and smite the enemy and they save the day. They get Lot Lot back and all of his stuff. And a lot of people don't uh, think of Abraham as this big tough type of character but i mean he he trained his servants himself to be an army so he's another pretty tough character in the bible notice that the men god uses in the bible are soldier like men they're not sissies they are bold and ready to fight just like we should be but our what the weapons of our warfare are not carnal we should know enough bible to be able to open it and ready to use the spiritual sword ready to fight spiritual battles we should be bold when it comes to things of God because we have the Bible and it's the truth. And when you have the truth and you know it, you should have boldness in that. But most of the book of Genesis from here on out is either about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or Joseph. And if you can remember that Genesis consists of 11 main stories. You have Genesis 1 through 2 and that's about the creation. You have Genesis 3 through 4 which is Adam and Eve. Genesis 5 is the generations of Adam. Genesis 6 through 9 is the story of Noah. Genesis 10 is the generations of Noah. Genesis 11 is the Tower of Babel. Genesis 12 through 25 is the story of Abraham and Isaac. Genesis 26 through 27 is the story of Jacob and Esau. Genesis 28 through 35 is the life of Jacob. Genesis 36 is the generation of Esau. And Genesis 37 through 50 is the life of Joseph. So familiarize yourself with the book of Genesis. Familiarize yourself with the stories in Genesis. Some of the greatest stories in the Bible are found in the first book of the Bible. And this book also has many types of Jesus Christ. You can find Jesus on every page. The types of Jesus Christ are people like Abel and Enoch and Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. It has two types of the Antichrist in the book of Genesis, which is Cain and Nimrod. So read the book of Genesis. Get familiar with the books of the Bible. You should be able to um, look at a book of the Bible and know what that book's about before you even read it again. But this has been an overview of the book of Genesis. This is going to be an overview of the book of Exodus. Exodus means to exit. It reminds us to exit from the world just like Israel exits from Egypt, which is a top of the world. So the writer is Moses, and in the book of Exodus you have an amazing thing. The first 11 chapters will show us our life before salvation. If you look at Exodus 1 and verse 6, it says, And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. So, good men die, and someone must take their place. Verse 7, And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. So before you were saved, you may have been successful at one point, but the devil ends up putting it to you, just like how Pharaoh does to Israel. And in this book, Pharaoh typifies the devil, while Egypt typifies the world. Now verse 8, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Joseph, being a type of Christ, this pictures an ungodly ruler who doesn't know Jesus Christ. So this ruler will hate God's people. So in these first 11 chapters, you have a picture of an unsaved man under the bondage of the sinful world and sin and the devil. And this is shown by Israel and Pharaoh. Pharaoh picturing the God of this world, putting Israel 
a picture of the unsaved man in bondage. So in the first 11 chapters, you also see a character pop up named Moses, a Levite. Now, Pharaoh had commanded for all the sons born to the children of Israel to be killed. So Moses' mother tried to hide him for three months, but when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes and laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And the daughter of Pharaoh found him and let his mother nurse him. So Moses, in this book, is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that God would raise up to deliver Israel from the bondage of Pharaoh in Egypt. Just like Jesus Christ delivers us from the devil and the world. In Colossians 1.13 it says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So Moses talks to the Lord in a burning bush, and the Lord lets him know how he can get the children of Israel to believe that he is a man sent from God. He gives him some sign gifts. Moses rod can turn into a snake can make his hand leprous as snow because you see israel started with signs and that's why israel requires a sign but moses gets some confidence and he confronts pharaoh pharaoh won't let the children of israel go so god brings the plagues through moses and i'm sure you've read these plagues in exodus chapter 7 the river is turned to blood in Exodus 8, you have a plague of frogs, a plague of lice and flies. In Exodus 9, Moses takes ashes of the furnace and brings the plague of disease on man and beast. Boils. Uh, the magicians couldn't even stand before Moses because of these boils. And the plague of hell kills man, beast, herb of the field, and it is mingled with fire. However, the Lord doesn't let the plague of disease affect the children of Israel, and the plague of hell doesn't affect Israel. This pictures how God will be with believing Israel during the tribulation. And then in Exodus 10, you have the plague of locusts and the thick darkness, and God blocks out their sun God. You see, a lot of people worship the sun, but God brings a thick darkness to black it out you see a lot of these plagues will show you things that happen in the tribulation for example the waters are turned to blood in the tribulation you see that plague of frogs here and the bible talks about unclean spirits like frogs that come out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the dragon and the false prophet and then you have moses here who brings a plague of hell you see hell in the tribulation. The plague of locusts in Revelation chapter 9. You have those locusts that come up out of the bottomless pit. So you see everything in the Old Testament will show you something in the New Testament. And then in Exodus 12 you have the Passover. And this pictures the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who shed his blood for the sins of man. And the great New Testament verse to match this is 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. It says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So in Exodus 12, on the tenth day of the first month, they shall bring a lamb. And your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. They shall kill the lamb in the evening, and take the blood of it and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house. They shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire, unleavened bread. And the Lord will pass through and smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt who doesn't have the blood on the door posts. So there was a great cry in Egypt because there was no house where a firstborn wasn't found dead. So here you have a picture of your redemption by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He isn't just a lamb, he is the lamb. And if you want salvation, he is your lamb. So also notice that Israel changes the beginning of their year to the Passover. Just like when you get saved, you have a new beginning. But Exodus 12 too, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. 
So just like after you got saved, after your Passover, you have a new beginning. Exodus 12, 5 says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. So the lamb is without blemish, just like the Lord Jesus Christ was without spot. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And then you see in Exodus 12, 8 through 9, And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. So notice how this pictures Christ our Lamb on the cross, to, who took our hell on the cross. And it says, roast with fire, nor sodden at all with water. And when Jesus Christ was on the cross, what did he say? He said, I thirst, because he took our hell, and there's no water in hell. So you see, you had the first 11 chapters showing you a picture of an unsaved man before he gets saved under the bondage of the world and the flesh and the devil. And now in chapter 12, you have a picture of your salvation. Now the rest of the book will show you your life after salvation. Notice how amazing the Bible is. Exodus gives you an outline of your life if you're a saved man. In Exodus 13... You see where the Lord wants to sanctify all the firstborn. At salvation, you are sanctified once and for all. But then after salvation, you need to live a sanctified life in the flesh here on this earth. So chapter 13 mentions sanctification. And now we have a picture of how Jesus Christ will never leave a born-again believer. In Exodus 13, 21 and 22... It says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day. Notice, He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So, no matter where I go or what I do or what time of day it is, He is with me to guide me. And now then in Exodus 14, you have the very famous story where Moses, through the power of God, will part the Red Sea and Israel will walk through on dry ground. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verses 1 and 2, it actually calls this a baptism. So what does that show us? Although this is a completely different baptism than we do today, it shows us one of the things we need to do after salvation as born-again Christians and that is get water baptized. So you have Exodus 12, the Passover, a picture of our redemption. And then after Exodus 12, you have things that show us things we should do after salvation. That is, live a sanctified life, get baptized. These things, you know, living a godly life and getting baptized doesn't have anything to do with salvation. That's why it's shown after Exodus 12 that pictures our salvation. But after salvation, what happens? If you're living a sanctified life, then you'll have a new song in your heart and in your mouth. In Psalms 40 and verse 3, He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and trust in the Lord. After I got saved, you know, this may not happen for everybody or happen for everybody right away, but after I got saved, I threw away my old CDs and I got a new song that something that literally happened in exodus 16 the lord drops manna from heaven and if you're doing what you ought to do as a christian then every day you open the bible and get bread from heaven from the word of god itself just like the lord gave them manna from heaven you get manna from the word of god uh, luke 4 4 says and jesus answered him saying it is written that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word of God. So, the word of God is your bread. Then in Exodus 17, Israel defeats Amalek. In Exodus 17, 11 through 13, it says, And it came to pass, 
when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, so and they took a stone and put it under him, and he set their own. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So this picture is a Christian sitting on the rock, Jesus Christ, and having a fellowship and prayer life with God, which Moses was sitting on the rock and holding his hands up, at the same time also lifting up other people in prayer is something this shows us. Just like Aaron and Hur stayed up Moses' hands. So this remind, should remind you to lift up people in prayer. And then in Exodus 25 through 30 you have the Ark of the Covenant, the table for bread, the golden lampstand. In Exodus 26 you have the tabernacle. In 27 you have the bronze altar, the court of the tabernacle. You have the oil for the lamp. In Exodus 28, you have the priest's garments. In Exodus 29, you have consecration for the priests. Exodus 30, the altar of incense, the bronze basin, the anointing oil. And all of these things picturing some New Testament truth that you could spend whole studies on. And then in Exodus 32, you have the children of Israel dancing, listening to worldly music that they learned from Egypt and they're worshiping a golden calf. And this is just picturing a backslid Christian wanting to go back to the world after he's been redeemed. And Romans 12, 2 says, But be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The bad things that Israel does is something that they learned from being in the world. And all through the book of Exodus, you see the outline of your life. Almost every situation you come to in your life will be represented in some way in the book of Exodus. In the first 11 chapters, you have Israel in bondage to Egypt, a type of the world, under Pharaoh, a type of the devil. And Israel shows you yourself as an unsaved man, without hope and without God in the world. But then you see a deliverer, which is Moses, who would represent Jesus Christ, which is your deliverer. As the Bible calls him, a prophet like unto Moses. So the Lord uses him to get Israel out of the bondage of the world. The, it, the Lord uses Moses to get the children of Israel out, under the, out from under the bondage of Pharaoh and Egypt. And in Exodus 12, you have the Passover, showing you your redemption that you receive from the shed blood of your Lord, the Lamb of God. Then the rest of the book shows you all kinds of things that you'll run into as a saved man. It is an outline for your life. So reading the book of Exodus, keep this in mind. And there's just so many different things you could go into in the book of Exodus. But I just wanted to use this to hopefully get you more interested in the book of Exodus. A lot of people can't read through the book of Exodus. They do okay until they get to chapter 25 and then they just stop. But it's a very interesting book. And all of these Old Testament books have excellent stories all of them have types of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can find Jesus on every page. You can find something for you on every page in the Old Testament.